So let's welcome Jess. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's on my bucket list to be introduced by Linda Rising. Um, so I can cross that off now. Thanks very much, Linda. Um, and in fact, a lot of this is inspired by um, work that Linda has done. So um, thanks very much. So my name's Jess Humble. Uh, among other things, I'm CTO of this small startup, DevOps Research. I'm co-author of these three books. DevOps Handbook is coming out this week, in fact, which is very exciting for me, because it's taken a very long time to be written. DevOps is basically at the peak of inflated expectations now, and the only way is down. So um, please review the session, and feel free to ask questions. And we have a microphone, so you can ask questions in real life. So, what I'm going to talk about in the next 50 minutes is, number one, how to make your data suck less, and in particular, in the context of writing surveys. Um, how do we do surveys in a scientific way? Um, we have been using surveys to find out about DevOps and good practice and what makes high-performing teams and organizations, and I'm going to talk about that today, um, how we, what the science tells us about how to build high-performing teams in particular. Um, I'm going to talk about continuous delivery, because uh, that's my thing. And also, it turns out to have a big impact on building high-performance teams. And I'm going to talk about management as well. So in order to understand this talk, you need to know about statistics. Um, my partner, um, my business partner, Nicole Forsgren, is, uh, she was professor of accounting at Utah State uh, and a statistician, and also in a previous life, uh, a systems administrator for large IBM mainframes. Um, so she knows all the stuff about stats. I will tell you everything I know about stats in this talk. Please do not ask me questions about stats. Please follow her on Twitter and ask her questions about stats instead, because she is the stats guru. So surveys. Who thinks that surveys are shit? Fair enough. Uh, who loves the data from their log files? And who has seen shitty data in their log files? Right. So, you know, data lies, and the job of statistics, um, despite its reputation, is to find truth in data. And, you know, statistics is useful in all different kinds of fields, but um, what we're trying to do is find out about sentiment, about what people believe, about things like culture. Um, and those are things that are difficult to measure. It's easy to measure something like temperature. You can get a thermometer or and measure temperature. Measuring what's inside people's heads is much more difficult. But it turns out that we can, in fact, do this. We have something called a, a latent construct, which allows us to measure things that are psychological. And there's a whole field devoted to the study of this called psychometrics. And so what we do is use psychometrics to enable us to measure things like culture in a statistically valid scientific, meaningful way. Um, and what statistics does is gives us what it says here, a reasonable assurance that the data is telling us what we think it's telling us. And by the way, some of these same techniques can be applied to, for instance, your log data. So what we do in psychometrics, firstly, we create what's called constructs. Constructs are what allow us to measure a thing um, in the real world, even if it's in someone's mind. What we tend to try and do wherever possible in science is use constructs that people have previously created and validated. Reuse is very important in science, because if you reuse stuff, you don't have to prove that the measure is reliable. There's a bunch of papers, a bunch of books in the literature. We draw on those wherever we can. Um, typically, the wording of those measures has been validated. We use things like card sorting to look at um, the questions we ask to make sure that you know, pe people sort cards into groups based on whether they think the question is asking the same thing. That allows us to tell us whether the different questions we're asking are measuring fundamentally the same thing or something different. Uh, and then we use statistics to evaluate the results of the surveys and validate that our constructs are actually good. We look at things like uh, discriminant and convergent validity. Um, so that's basically making sure that um, our results are consistent and that uh, 
Uh, the things that should be related are in fact related and then not unrelated. And we establish the reliability of the construct. We talk about prediction in the reports that we put out. And prediction is a very important word because it implies some level of causation. In science, there's only three contexts in which you can use the word prediction. One is if you're doing a longitudinal study. So you're doing a study where you evaluate the system at multiple points in time. Those are quite hard to do, and we are not doing longitudinal studies. The other way in which we can talk about prediction is in the context of randomized controlled experiments. We can't, those are very difficult to do. And one of the reasons why there's so little science in the study of um, high-performing teams in the context of software development is because it's so hard to do randomized controlled experiments in the context of, of teams because there are too many variables, and we can't control the variables. You try and compare two different teams, uh, and there's... Um, it, it, actually, Stephen Forshu once told me a story about uh, looking at uh, a team that was estimating and they, couldn't, they, they, they found that the, the historical estimates were totally useless in predicting the future performance of the team. And they were looking at, well, what's different between last release when these estimates were good and, and this release when they're not good? Uh, and eventually, what they found is the team had been moved and had been sitting in a room with windows. And then the team had been moved down into a basement where there were no windows and the team wasn't getting any light. And this is the only thing they could think of as a, as a reason why suddenly the team was much less productive. So things like this that we don't expect to be variables uh, are, are very often you know, actually very important. Uh, and it's in, almost impossible to control for those kinds of variations. So it's very hard to do randomized controlled experiments in the context of teams. So we use the third method of um, demonstrating prediction we use theory-based design. And what that means is we have a theory based ideally on the literature, on existing studies, uh, and if not, on our hypothesis. And then we go and run the data, and then we get the data back, and we validate if the data shows that our, our hypothesis is true or false. So you know, this is very basic kind of Baconian science, if you like. Um, but it, it, it works, and it does allow us to talk about prediction, and we found some interesting things, and crucially, we've had a bunch of our ideas disproved as well, which is one of the ways that you know you're doing it right if some of your theories are, in fact, false. So I'm going to talk about the things that we found that weren't true as well as some of the things that we found that were true. Where none of these conditions apply, we don't talk about prediction. We talk about correlation. So I'm going to talk about an example of um, using psychometrics to measure culture, which was one of the things that we measured when we were looking at how to build high-performing teams. So culture, it matters to our study, but there's many different kinds of culture. People talk about, for example, national identity and differences between behaviors from people from different countries. People talk about adaptive cultures. There's this concept of value learning. Um, the one we actually ended up using was uh, looking at culture in the context of information flow which is from uh, a scientist called Ron Westrom, who's studying safety outcomes, actually, in healthcare and aviation. And he built a model to predict safety outcomes in healthcare and aviation based on information flow throughout the organization. And so we used his model as our basis for measuring culture. So this is Westrom's typology. He basically divides up organizations based on whether they're pathological bureaucratic or generative. And he has these six different axes for looking at um, how people behave in these different types of organizations, whether they cooperate effectively, um, how we deal with messengers. How do we deal with people when they bring us bad news? Do we train people to bring us bad news? Do we ignore people who bring us bad news? Or do we shoot people who bring us bad news? How do we deal with responsibilities and, and risks? How do we deal with bridging between different parts of the organization, between different silos? And then two things that I'm particularly fond of. Um, how we deal with failure. Does it lead to inquiry, to learning? Does it lead to justice? Or does it lead to scapegoating and, and punishing? One of the things that is very important about organizations is that organizations of people are complex systems. And there's a whole theory, there's a whole you know, field devoted to the study of complex adaptive systems. 
But I think two things are very important about complex adaptive systems. Number one, nobody has perfect information, especially not management. And the other thing that's important about complex adaptive systems is that you can never predict the outcome of your actions. There will always be unanticipated side effects, and often the side effects will be bigger in impact than the intended effects. So in a complex adaptive system where no one has perfect information and you can never predict the consequences of your actions, failure is inevitable. In any complex adaptive system, failure is inevitable. And so when something goes wrong, our instincts as humans is to find out who did it and to punish them or fire them. But in a complex adaptive system, that's entirely the wrong thing to do. Whenever that happens, you should always ask yourself, if that had been me doing that thing, could I have made the same mistake? And the answer, if we're honest, is almost always yes, I could have done. And the reason is because the person there didn't have sufficient information or didn't have the necessary tools at their disposal to test what would happen if they did thing X. And so if you perform an investigation into something going wrong, and the end result of the investigation was, it was Stephen, let's fire him, you have failed. That should be the beginning of your investigation. Why did Stephen do that thing? How can we improve the information Stephen has? How can we give Stephen better systems to enable Stephen to test the results of this action and uh, safely fail quickly if that thing is going to lead to some disastrous consequence that Stephen couldn't possibly have predicted? And then finally, how we deal with novelty. Is it implemented? Does it lead to problems like scope creep? Or well, my favorite is novelty crushed. And I think probably intuitively everyone knows where they are uh, on this spectrum. And what's fascinating to me is, um, as I'll show later, the same factors that predict safety outcomes also predict innovation outcomes. The same factors that predict safety outcomes also predict innovation outcomes. And the reason for that is you've got to be in a system, if you're going to innovate, where you can try things out and get things wrong, and where it's safe to get things wrong. The same factors that enable us to build safe, complex adaptive systems also are the same factors that enable us to innovate. So we're trying to write questions for this. Um, try and write questions to find out where people are. I'll give you like a minute to think of a way to write a question uh, to, to test one of these things. So just think of what you would ask. What we want to do when we're asking questions is use strong statements with clear language, things that you could agree or disagree with strongly. So these are the questions that we actually asked. So, you know, this second one. On my team, failures are learning opportunities and messages of them are not punished. That's something you can strongly agree or disagree with. So when we did the analysis, we found these uh, questions to give results that were both valid and reliable. And turns out they're predictive of IT performance and organizational performance, which I'll define shortly. So when we ask these questions, what we do is we use what's called a Likert type scale, where you can go from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And you know, this, is, this gives you one, and this gives you seven. And then you just take the numbers from these different questions, and you average them. And that gives you a number for culture. So we can quantify culture in this way. However, sometimes statistical analysis shows that the measure is not valid and reliable. So we, for example, wanted to ask about uh, failure notifications. Um, we thought that you know, when teams are notified about failures, that would tell us something about their IT performance. So these are the questions that we asked about failure notification. Um, so it turns out this was not a valid and reliable measure. When we performed statistical analysis, this, this turned out not to be a thing, basically. Um, any idea why that might be? What the statistics doesn't tell you is why it's not a valid or reliable thing. You have to guess. So what we ended up doing is we kind of thought about this, and we thought, well, actually, this is kind of asking two different things. The first two things are kind of asking us about notification from outside of our team, 
and the rest of the things are asking us about notification of failure from data that we can gather from within our team. Um, and they're actually two different things. And when we split the results from these questions into two separate things, those things independently did, in fact, turn out to be valid and reliable measures. Um, so this is a, an example of the kind of thing you do when you do statistical analysis. You find out, well, actually, you know, these are multiple things, or you know, this whole thing isn't a thing at all. Or sometimes you can combine things and take a bunch of things that you thought weren't exactly the same, but actually they all move in the same way in the data. So there's a bunch of other stuff that Nicole does, uh, you know, comparing early responders versus late responders to see if they're statistically different, looking at survey drop-off rates, looking at biases, um, and there's some statistical tests she does around common method variants. I have no idea what that is. Um, so once you've done all this work, then we can look at the data. And this is what the data tells us. First of all, we found that IT performance matters. We've been told for years that IT doesn't matter that it can't provide you a consistent strategic advantage in terms of innovation, we found that's not true. We used a standardized measure of organizational performance in terms of profitability, market share, and productivity. And what we found is high performers were twice as likely to exceed those organizational performance goals as low performers in IT. So we found that IT performance does have an impact on your organization's bottom line. Secondly, we were able to find a statistically valid way to measure IT performance. So who was at Kevlin's talk this morning? Great. So uh, he talked about that study, um, the, uh, what's it called, with the two axes? The, 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 the... Yeah, the alignment trap, right? So in the alignment trap, on the right, bottom right, there's the bit about high, highly efficient IT. What we have found a way to measure is that, basically. How do you demonstrate that you're highly efficient? How do you measure your efficiency? Uh, and that is obviously where you want to go before you go for alignment. Um, so if you want to measure IT efficiency, this is what uh, we believe you should use. And our IT performance metric actually is two separate things, which we found were actually one statistically valid measure. So the top two things are throughput. How fast can we deliver? How long does it take us to get changes from version control to production, lead time, and deploy frequency? And then two measures of stability. How long does it take us to restore service when there's an outage or um, a degradation in service quality? And then change fail rate. When we push a change out to production, what percentage of the time does it fail? Uh, or do we have to do emergency fixes? Because as we all know, no one ever rolls back. We just emergency fix until it works. So, Two different measures, throughput and stability. Traditionally, we've been led to think that these two things are a trade-off. If we go faster, we will break things. The most interesting result for me from the whole study, and the one thing you should take away from today, is that that is not true. What we found is that high performers do better on both of these things. High performers achieve higher levels of throughput and higher levels of stability. This is not a trade-off, and this is why DevOps is a thing, in my opinion, is because we found a way to change the game. We're no longer operating in a trade-off, which is where, as engineers, we usually operate. We've actually changed the game, and we're now able to move to a different paradigm where we're improving both throughput and stability, and the data clearly shows this out. What we find is that high performers are performing deployments on demand. They're achieving lead times of less than an hour. They can restore service, typically, in minutes. Uh, and their change fail rate is 0 to 15%, whereas low performers are achieving uh, deploy frequencies typically on a monthly basis. They're achieving lead times of between one and six months. Uh, they can typically get uh, lead times, uh, restore service in, in less than a day, but certainly not in minutes, uh, and they're achieving change fail rates between 16 and 30%. So a big difference between the high performers and the low performers. And you can think of organizations like Amazon and Google on, on this axis, and then you know, much more traditional waterfall um, organizations on this axis. But crucially, the same capabilities that enable you to move fast if done right also enable you to restore service and fix problems fast as well. We've lived in a world for ages where we've been focused on how do we prevent things from happening. In complex adaptive systems, you can't do that. You can't prevent bad things from happening. 
complex adaptive systems will naturally drift into failure. So the question becomes not how can we prevent failure, but how can we recover from failures as fast as possible? How can we detect them? How can we fix them as fast as possible? When the next CVE comes out and there's a flaw in our SSL libraries, how soon can we get a patch out to all our servers? These are the questions we need to be asking. How can we restore service? And the same capabilities that allow us to move fast also allow us to detect and respond to failures faster as well, creating more secure, safe, resilient systems. So if you look at the things that give us the highest correlation with IT performance, um, this is what we found. Number one, having your codes, application configuration, and system configuration in version control. And what was interesting about this was that it was more important to have your application configuration and your system configuration in version control than it was to have your code in version control. So who actually can recreate their production system purely from information and scripts in version control? OK. Who relies on manually logging into consoles and changing things in order to configure their production systems. OK, that's about half-half, which is actually pretty good, I think. But that's a great example. Ooh, got a drinking problem, apparently. Um, that's a great example of a capability which allows you to move faster and create more resilient systems. Being able to do this, being able to have this capability, allows us to create testing systems much more quickly, so we can create test environments on demand in this way. Also, if there's a failure in production and we need to restore um, the state of our system to a previous good known state, we can do that programmatically in a deterministic amount of time. If you're logging into consoles and editing um, configuration settings, that is non-deterministic because humans make mistakes. Whereas if we can do that purely in an automated fashion, we can restore service in a predictable deterministic amount of time that allows us to restore service faster. So that's a great example of a capability that increases throughput and also increases resilience. Getting failure alerts from logging and monitoring systems, not from, say, Twitter. Something that's very dear to my heart, developers merging their code into trunk daily, not working on long-lived feature branches, where we merge into the feature branches regularly, but actually working in small batches on trunk and merging changes into trunk on a daily basis. That's very important. Probably the most important thing I look for in a developer is that ability to break down big problems into smaller problems and check those problems into master, into trunk on a daily basis or more frequently. Uh, also this bit, which I just talked about, developers break up large features into small incremental changes. So these, these two things are essential to continuous delivery. And then finally, the DevOps piece, when development and operations teams interact, the outcome is generally win-win. So these are the things that have the highest correlation with IT performance. Uh, when we want to look at prediction, uh, <laughs> the biggest predictor of IT performance from the 2014 study, and I'll move on to the more recent studies in a minute, um, was having a peer-reviewed change approval process. What do we mean by this? So there's a couple of ways you can do change approval. One is a peer review process, which is basically pair programming or um, code review by people inside your team. And there's also external change approval processes, like having a change approval board um, or, or some other team um, testing your changes or, or reviewing your changes. So who only relies on internal uh, peer review approval in order to go live? Okay, who has to have approvals for an external team in order to put their code into production, like a change approval board? Okay, that's about a third of you. So it turns out that doesn't work. It produces much lower throughput, as you would expect. But having an external team do change approval has negligible positive impact on the stability of the systems you build. So in terms of actually improving the safety of the systems you build, it has a negligible impact, but it massively reduces throughput. Um, and, and much of that kind of thing is, is what I like to call uh, risk management theater. Um, I, once, I, had, I had a colleague uh, when I was working at ThoughtWorks who worked at a large European electronics manufacturer, and they, um, they had a change approval process which involved a spreadsheet with seven tabs with the details of the change that you would email to a change manager in another country who would read those changes, and the change manager was non-technical, so they didn't really understand what was written there. Uh, and they would phone up the dev lead and you know, ask questions. Uh, and if they liked the sound of the answers, they would approve it. Otherwise, they wouldn't. 
And uh, the developers knew that the change manager didn't understand what was in the spreadsheet, so they would just copy the last one and change a few things and then send it on. And the change manager knew that the developers knew that the change manager didn't know what was in the spreadsheet. And at this point, what we have is risk management theater, not, in fact, a process for effectively managing risk. And this is exactly what our data tells us to be the case. Proactive monitoring, win relationship between dev and ops, and then this thing, which I'm going to talk about, high trust organizational culture. This is what we measured with the Western typology, and we find that the culture of your organization predicts both IT performance and organizational performance. So this result has been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, you can go and download the, the paper. I'll have a link at the end of this slide. We have real science that shows that culture has a measurable impact on IT performance and organizational performance. Uh, and this study was kind of replicated by Google. So Google did some research into what makes a good team. And they had all kinds of hypotheses, you know, two node developers and a database administrator and a, a manager, or let's have no managers and see how that works. And what they found was really interesting was that the composition of the team in terms of the skill balance was not actually useful in finding successful teams. What they found was this. The most important thing in determining whether a team was going to be successful at Google was psychological safety. Team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. Kind of looks similar to this. And then dependability, structure and clarity, the meaning of the work they were doing and the impact that it was doing. And what we actually found uh, in last year's study we had two other measures that we, we measured because we were trying to break this down. And what we find is that actually, in terms of the statistical analysis, when we analyze this, this in fact doesn't work as a single construct. It's not a valid and reliable construct when we measure the results. It's actually two separate constructs. Um, these two, I, I can't remember if number three went with one and two or whether it went with four and five. But four and five are one thing, one and two are another thing, and three either goes up or down. I'm not sure which. Um, but we were able to identify two separate elements that were constructs that formed this thing that Google found, um, told them whether a team was going to be successful. So I'm going to move on and talk a bit about continuous delivery. What we found is that continuous delivery impacts IT performance. Uh, and this is the math version. So there's a couple of things that we look at when we do the math. Uh, one is the beta. And beta tells you about the strength of the effect. And then the other thing, which is probably the most important thing, is R squared. R squared tells you what proportion of the variance in that measure is caused by the things that point to it. So what this tell us, tells us is that 28.8% of the variance in IT performance is explained by continuous delivery. 6.2% uh, of the variance in... IT performance, oh, sorry, no, that, no, that's a beta, not an R squared. Okay, let's look at this one. 14% um, of the variation in organizational performance is explained by both IT performance and organizational culture. And all these things were statistically significant. So what we found by looking at the survey data is, A, we had a, a way to talk about continuous delivery. What is continuous delivery? Well, it's these things. Version control, the use of test automation, the use of deployment automation, and the use of continuous integration. All these things were statistically significant, um, and these things together we called continuous delivery, and we show that they impact change fail rate, IT performance, and also burnout. So what we found is that teams practicing continuous delivery had lower levels of burnout. And again, using psychometrics, we can measure burnout. Uh, again, using previous models that have been studied and found to be valid. Also reduces deployment pain very, very significantly. It explains 46% of the variance in um, deployment pain. Uh, and this is the paper that you can download where we published this. In 2016, this year, we extended this model, and we added some new things in. And these were all the things that we found to be valid. We also added effective test, test data management to our definition of continuous delivery. Uh, also, trunk-based development. So trunk-based development means you don't use long-lived feature branches. You use feature branches, that's fine, but you're merging them into trunk on a daily basis or more often. 
Uh, I've been banging on about This is still the most controversial thing that I speak about. I've been speaking about this for 15 years, about trunk-based development and not using long-lived feature branches. And then Git came along, and Git flow came along, and everyone's like, you should do Git flow. And like, never has something been more poorly named than Git flow. Um, you know, it's great for developer flow. Uh, in terms of flow from version control to production, it's the worst thing you can possibly do. Because guess what? We don't actually want to optimize for the rate at which a developer can declare something dev complete on a feature branch. What we actually want to optimize for is the rate at which we can get changes from version control to production. Um, so trunk-based development, I've been saying for years, uh, is an important thing. The data shows that this is, in fact, true. Um, this is why I love surveys. They're such a rich source of confirmation bias. Um, and then we looked at security as well. Uh, incorporating security and security teams into the delivery process also impacts uh, IT performance and organizational performance. Uh, we found there was a, a predictive link between CD and uh, culture. And then this is the thing that moved with uh, Google culture stuff, identifying with the organization you work for. We also wanted to find a way to measure quality. And of course, quality is very hard to measure because quality is subjective. So we were looking for some proxies that we could use to measure quality. The one that we found actually worked uh, and gave us statistically um, reliable and valid measure was the amount of rework that got done. Uh, and what we found is that uh, continuous delivery reduces the amount of re rework that gets done. Uh, and these are the full results. Um, what we find is that high performers spend 29% more of their time on new work than low performers and 22% less time on unplanned work, unplanned work and rework. So high performers spend less of their time reworking stuff because they have faster feedback loops, um, and hence they can spend more time on building new features. Um, and this tells us what we kind of intuitively know, that if we spend time on things like test automation, deployment automation, refactoring, producing higher quality code bases, that means we can move faster. And this is the argument we give to managers you know, if you just let us do this, we'll be able to move faster. Oh, we don't have time to do that because we've got to deliver the features. Well, there's an obvious fallacy there, right? Which is the reason it's taking us so long to deliver the features is because you have a shitty code base and no automation. Um, but it's hard to make that argument. Um, so here are some numbers that you can use to actually make that argument using science. However, some surprises. Um, if there were no surprises, we wouldn't be doing science. Uh, we wanted to look at effective test practices. So these were some questions um, that we wanted to see if these things impacted IT performance. Which of these things do you think doesn't impact IT performance or negatively impacts IT performance? Have a guess. Outsourcing. All of them. So it turns out that the things in red negatively impact um, or don't impact IT performance. This was a bit of a surprise, developers creating on-demand test environments. And again, we don't know why. The statistics doesn't tell us why. It just tells us no. Um, these things are kind of, I mean, outsource parties, it should be obvious. I mean, I've, I work with a large retail company um, where they got an outsourced party to build unit tests, and they said, we want 100% coverage, and they got 100% coverage. And they were like, yes, fabulous. And they looked at the unit tests, and the unit tests all had a cert true. 100% test coverage, well done. Um, this is interesting for me. QA primarily create and maintain acceptance tests. Um, Again, all this stuff is predictive, so we have hypothesis behind this. My hypothesis that I was testing here is that when developers build and maintain the acceptance tests, it exerts a force on them that makes them develop code that's easier to test. I think having the developers create and maintain the acceptance tests, working with testers, is actually very important, because otherwise there's no feedback loop acting on the developers to make them write more testable code. If you try and add acceptance tests to software that was not designed in a test-driven way, it, those acceptance tests are typically very painful and expensive to maintain. If the developers are responsible for building and maintaining the tests, that 
because that's a force on them to write more testable code, which is what makes the acceptance test easier to maintain. So here's some science which provides some backing for the idea that test-driven development is important as a design tool to help you write more testable code, which in turn makes the tests cheaper and easier to maintain. So uh, change management, again, well, we've kind of talked about this. What we found is that um, we thought that this would actually, we thought we'd been quite clever here. Only high-risk changes, so as database, such as database changes, require approval. We found that actually doesn't correlate with IT performance at all. Um, so I want to talk a bit about the management results that we found. Um, so we all know that managing working process is important, right? Working process limits, imposing working process limits, that's going to create higher throughput. This is you know, a well-known fact about, um, about you know, the lean canon and Kanban and so forth. What we found is that that's actually not important at all in terms of correlation between um, management practices and IT performance. Having working process limits has no correlation with IT performance. That's a huge surprise. This is something that should obviously be true. What's going on here? What we found is that working process is important, but only when you combine it with other practices. The model that we ended up actually, uh, that actually produced uh, statistically valid results is this one. So this is called a structured equation model, um, which is a statistical technique that you can use to create you know, DAGs that show prediction. Um, Working process limits, together with these other things, um, oops, sorry, I've given you the wrong diagram. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be very agile about this. This is the actual diagram. Never do something after a gin on a flight. Um, so effective working process limits that drive process improvement predict IT performance in combination with the use of visual displays to monitor quality, quality productivity, and working process, and the use of application performance and infrastructure monitoring tools to make business decisions. These three things together, which we're calling, for the sake of argument, lean management, uh, you know, it's short and snappy, uh, those three things together predict high performance, lower levels of burnout, and improved culture. But these things on their own do not predict that. So you can't just add whip limits and expect higher IT performance. You also have to use visual displays, and you also have to use data from your tools and have feedback loops from what your tools are telling you and the decisions you're making. So that was a really interesting thing that we weren't expecting. This year, we also wanted to look at product management. So this is what we came out with this year um, in terms of some factors that are important in product management in the lean context. Gathering, broadcasting, and implementing customer feedback and splitting work into small batches and making the flow of work visible through the delivery process, those things together impact um, IT performance, lower levels of deployment pain, generative performance-oriented culture, and also identifying strongly with the organization you work with, which was one of the parts of Google's measure of effective teams. Uh, and as we saw earlier, IT performance impacts organizational performance, as does Westrom's culture. So that's a, a snapshot of some of the results from the last four years of the surveys we've done. Um, they're, they are really big studies. Um, we've had over 20,000 responses to our surveys. That's about 100x what you need to demonstrate statistical significance. A lot of statistical studies uh, are based on very small sample sizes, about the smallest you can possibly use and get away with in terms of statistical, statistical significance. Uh, we have an enormous data set. Very, very large, uh, so we have a lot of confidence in our, in our results. Um, we've published four State of DevOps reports that you can go and download, and we have two peer-reviewed papers published based on these results. Um, the conclusions, number one, 
Even if you think it's obvious, test with data. Managing WIP limits, the fact that didn't correlate with IT performance, that was a huge surprise for us. Um, so actually testing things with real data, very, very important. If the results don't surprise you, you're doing it wrong. It's just confirmation bias. However, if everything you thought was wrong, you're probably also doing it wrong. Some of the things that you expect should indeed prove to be true, um, unless you know, you're highly deluded. But hey, we all work in computer science. Um, the most important thing from these results that I took away is that throughput and stability is not a zero-sum game. We can improve both throughput and stability, and the people who are doing it right are getting better at both. And finally, we found a statistically valid way to measure culture, and we showed that culture and the practices that you do on the ground have a measurable impact not just on IT performance, but also organizational performance. So we have some time for questions. Um, if you pick up your phone and send an email to this email address, jezhumble at sendyourslides.com with the subject DevOps. That's jezhumble at sendyourslides.com with the subject DevOps. You get a bunch of free stuff. Uh, I've written these books. Uh, I work for this organization. Uh, we can help survey your team. Thanks very much for your time. Questions? Questions for Jez? Nobody has a question? No, there's okay. one right here. I finally get to have a little exercise today. Please We're, vote on your phones and, and give feedback. Um, hi there. Um, why do you think that developers creating on-demand testing environments negatively impact their performance? Yeah, why do I think that developers creating on-demand test environment negligibly impacted performance? Well, I think there's, there's two strong candidates. One is that that on its own won't give you higher IT performance. It's probably that in combination with something else. That's one hypothesis. The other hypothesis is just that we ask the question badly. So often, you know, the way that you word the question can cause, uh, cause you to get bad results. And it's kind of surprising. Like Some of the questions that I thought were quite badly worded actually turn out to give us um, valid, reliable results. So, you know, look at the question we asked about culture. I mean, someone picked me up on this the other day. You know, on my team, information is actively sought. Well, that's a horribly worded question. It's in the passive voice. Um, but it turns out it's a reliable, valid measure. And it may be that the question that we asked about on-demand test environments actually was badly worded, or you know, maybe it just on its own doesn't do anything, and you have to combine it with other things. So those are, our, that, those are my hypotheses as to why that didn't work out. Um, just related to that, is it possible the, um, did you check the scales of testing? So on-demand test environments might encourage end-to-end -end rather than unit testing. Yeah, I mean, that's another hypothesis. And again, we can go and look at the data uh, and test that. We actually didn't ask many questions about integrated testing, which is definitely an avenue to explore in future surveys. So yeah, that's a good question. Have you validated your statistics using other methods, methods than, than quantitative data? For instance, qualitative methods by participating in teams, high-performing teams, observing them, validating their practices? Yeah, no, this is a purely quantitative study. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of fetishize data, uh, and data definitely doesn't tell you the whole story. Um, data, in particular, can't tell you why people are doing the things that they're doing. Um, so data is limited. It gives you one perspective. It tells you whether or not your hypothesis is true. It doesn't tell you why it's happening. So I think you know, qualitative studies are very important. Um, John Allspore did a talk at Craft Conference, which I believe is online this year, where he talked about looking at qualitative data. Dave Snowden has a whole sense-making system which is based on qualitative uh, narrative data. I think that's very important. We didn't look at it at all. This is a purely quantitative study. So you already mentioned uh, confirmation bias. <laughs> and I was wondering, are there any other biases or um, logical fallacies that you see a lot in the software development world? Yeah, um, I mean, there's a, there's a huge range of biases. Um, some biases you can detect using statistical analysis. Um, the, the main bias that we're somewhat concerned about is sample bias. Um, just because the kind of people who answer these surveys, the kind of people we can reach are typically more high-performing. Um, 
So we are a bit worried about sample bias in as much as we think the population of low performers in the real world, we, we guess, is much bigger than the proportion of, of, of low performers that we found in the sample data. However, that doesn't mean the results are invalid because we're still able to break the population, the, the cohort who answered the survey, into those populations. Um, it, it's just that we think the relative sizes of them aren't representative, but we do think that the, um, the characteristics of them are, in fact, valid. So, um, you know, biases are a thing. Um, we can correct for many of them. Um, confirmation bias we correct for basically by making sure you know, I was kind of joking about that, um, but, but you know, it's, confirmation bias is a real thing. The, re, the way we correct for confirmation bias is you know, the theory-based design, which is that we come up with the hypotheses before we gather the data. Um, what you can't do is like, get the data and then you know, mine the data and look for things which look interesting in terms of correlations and say, well, that's the thing. Like, that would be invalid. So you can't look at interesting correlations and then announce them as results that demonstrate prediction. Um, what you have to do is come up with the hypotheses first and then gather the data. Otherwise, it's not science. Um, so that's what uh, kind of corrects for confirmation bias to some extent. Um, yeah, that's the limit of my knowledge. It is a very interesting question, which biases we do um, correct for or detect using the statistics would be a question for Nicole. Thanks. Hi. Uh, are there any indicators about um, environments where continuous delivery is delivering to internal customers versus external customers? Um, great question. We didn't look at that. So you mentioned the trunk-based thing is the one that causes most controversy. Yes. Um, what do you have to say to someone who's done trunk-based and now does something else and thinks it's proven much better? Um, is it, isn't it? I mean, the statistics don't tell the complete story. It's an average of all the people you asked. But there's still possible to be a unique snowflake which has... <laughs> you know, other. Yeah, I mean, you know, everything I'm presenting is a model, and models are necessarily, li necessarily limited. Models will only give you one perspective. Models can't tell you everything. Uh, they do allow you to make predictions, but those predictions never have 100% certainty. Uh, predictions always come with um, an error bar, if you like. So, um, yeah, I mean, in real life, Everyone is different. We are all facing complex adaptive systems. There are situations in which, um, you know, the, this advice will be wrong for you, uh, and that's why, you know, we're all human beings who are, you know, trained professionals by using our experience. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that you should mechan mechanistically follow the things we say here. Absolutely not. What I can tell you is that, you know, in aggregate, this is true based on the limitations of the model. Real life, as we know, does not always follow the model. Um, so yeah, I mean, I absolutely accept there are situations in which this advice may not apply. And you know, the, the only way to find out is to try different things and experiment and find out what work, works best. Um, but you should do that based on setting out your measurable objective first, and then coming up with a hypothesis, and then testing that hypothesis. And that, I think, is really a big part of what's missing in the way that we practice software delivery today, is doing it in that kind of scientific way. People have retrospectives. they like, we should try this. And they try it, and they never come back and find out if it was better. And they never define in advance what better would look like in measurable terms. And I think a lot of what we should be doing in software development is doing this in the small. So every time we try an improvement, let's define what we're going to measure to find out if that improvement was the right thing to have done, and let's come back later and see if that actually made things better. And another thing this is useful for is as a source of things to measure to see what good looks like. So you, know, you can use this IT performance metric. Um, I think it's very valuable for exactly that purpose. Do you have any information about um, using DevOps practices in uh, high regulatory like HIPAA environments or um, 
uh, high business risk PCI DSS uh, environments? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I did a talk on this yesterday um, where we're doing exactly that. So one of my, in fact, my day job is working for the US government. Um, <laughs> where, and I'm going to borrow from my talk yesterday. Uh, it's, it's the most highly regulated environment I've ever been in. I actually went to work for the government because I thought, you know, if we can make it work here, we can make, make it work anywhere. Boy, did I get what I asked for. Um, you know, this is the complete list of controls that have to be true for any federally approved government information system. There are, and that, those are just the high level ones, that each of those controls is ba split up into sub controls. So you have to implement hundreds of controls before you can put a system live in the US federal government. These techniques absolutely apply in that environment, and they are perhaps more important in a regulated environment because that's where we actually care about creating more resilient systems. So yes, you can apply these. My co-author on my continuous delivery book, Dave Farley, worked at LMAX, which was at the time the highest throughput financial exchange in the world, uh, based in London. Um, they implemented deployment pipelines, and the auditors loved it because instead of a piece of paper, you know. When we actually, in the federal government and, and other places, when you do this, what you end up with is a big stack of paper that says that this is what you're doing. Does that bear relation to what you're actually doing? Who knows? If you have a deployment pipeline that says exactly which changes ran, had which tests run against them, where they were deployed to, what scripts were run as a result of that deployment, what the output was, that's fabulous for auditors. It's really useful information. So absolutely, these techniques apply in regulated environments. They are arguably even more important in that context. So please remember to vote. Thank you, Jez. It's wonderful. Thank Science. You.